Hey, Compassion fam, welcome to week two of Mind Monsters, where we're getting down into this topic that everybody's talking about, mental health. So no matter where you are, this message is for you. Don't forget, like, share, comment, and we're gonna get this service started.
He will never, he ever, will never, ever fail you. Do you believe that today? That God does not fail. He does not fail. He's a God that cannot fail. Amen. I want you to lift your hands to him this morning. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, God. Your word says that even when we are not faithful, God, you are still faithful. So we thank you for that today. We praise you. We're confident today, God, knowing that you have our best interest, that you know what is best for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you never fail us, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And we thank you for that, Jesus. No matter what we have done, somebody listen, no matter what you have done this week, God still loves you. And he's faithful to you. And he wants you to know that it doesn't matter. That he forgives you, he loves you, and he'll never leave or forsake you. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that word. We love you, God. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Come on, just give him a praise offering today. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of God? We're so glad that you're here. As we sing this next song, uh, the, the prayer team is going to come down front, and they want to pray with you today. If you have a need this morning, whatever it is, God is faithful, and he wants to meet your need. He wants to answer your prayer. So come down here in agreement with this prayer team that your need will be met. Amen? Amen.
better if you do it his way. Come on, do you receive that today? If you would just stop doing things the way you think they should be done, if you would just stop and listen to the voice of the Father who knows better than we do for our lives, things would be better. Come on, all across this room, let's stretch our hands to heaven this morning. God, you see us, and our hands are lifted high. Our willingness, our willingness to know and recognize that things are better your way. God, if we just let go and release, God, release control and let you have control. God, we believe that you want to do something new in our lives today. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for, for all that you're doing in this place. God, I pray right now that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what you have for us this day. God, you are our greatest defender. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, would you tell him you love him today? Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We honor you. Come on, let's give God praise one more time this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. And we thank you. Welcome again to Compassion Church. We're so glad that you're here. It's great to see you. You may be seated. Compassion Church. I'm Krista Little, and we're so glad that you're with us this weekend. We want to take a few minutes and share some of the things coming up for you and your family here at Compassion. We want to be the kind of people who are continually growing and pursuing a deeper and more meaningful relationship with God. That is why we encourage everyone to take one of the many next steps available here at Compassion. Maybe you want to celebrate what God has done in your life through baptism or sign up to start serving on a team. To get involved in any of these areas, simply fill out the Orange Connect card and drop it in the offering. You can also sign up for Next Steps online at Compassion.cc. For more information on anything you've seen or heard, grab one of our hosts or visit us online at Compassion.cc. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and being part of the family here at Compassion. Well, good morning, Compassion. We are so thankful for your continued easy to give. You can go to compassion.cc slash give, or you can text the dollar amount to 84321 and make sure that you select Compassion Church, Wichita Falls. God, we just thank you for everything that you're doing here at Compassion Church. We pray over this offering and ask that you will just bless it and multiply it and use it for exactly what you want to do. We love you. We adore you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning, Compassion. I want you to do me a favor today. I just want you to stand to your feet. Can you do that for me today? I'm going to do things a little different. I'm going to start out today reading the passage that God has laid upon my heart. As we continue our sermon series, uh, Mind Monsters, last week we began to talk about anxiety and what anxiety is. It's, the, it's our body's reaction to fear. Well, this week, instead of talking about the reaction to fear, I want to talk about what causes fear. I want to talk about what causes fear in our life. And I, I want you to look with me today in Genesis chapter 32. We're going to look at verse 7 and verse 8. And it says here, In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups. And the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, and here's, I want you to remember this next word. It's, it's coming up there. He thought if, say if with me, if, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Say that word with him one more time. If Lord, we pray today over every man and woman that is here that their hearts and minds be open to receive, God, what you've got in store and let not one, not one leave this service the same way that they came but be blessed by your word and your presence in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Before you're seated, turn to someone. Give them a fist bump, no handshakes. Give them a fist bump and tell them you're glad to have them in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. I can already tell some people are talking to my wife up on the front row. We're not going to talk about yesterday. We're going to keep that to ourselves so that y'all will still love me and not hate me at the end of service. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying a word. Just leave me alone. I've kept quiet. I've just been nice. Amen. As we look at this passage here in Genesis chapter 32, it's a story of a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob, in fact, his name actually means trickster. Trickster. And uh, Jacob, what had happened is when Jacob, even at birth, when he was coming out of the womb, he literally, his twin brother named Esau, uh, the Bible says he literally reached up, grabbed his brother's heel, in other words, trying to pull him back in so he could be the first out. So before he even knew that he was a trickster, well, he was a trickster. And the reason being is you have to understand in the Hebrew culture, uh, the firstborn got a double portion of everything, a double portion of everything. We would have done that to our son, but we didn't have enough to give him a double portion. So what happens is most of his life, Esau was a, well, he was a man's man. Uh, Esau liked to go and hunt. <laughs> Uh, he liked to be out in the, in, the, in the woods, and he liked to be doing manly man things. And the, the Bible tells us that, well, Jacob was a little different. He liked to be more around his mom, and he was back at home with her while she was working in the kitchen and, and all of that. And, well, Esau was his dad's favorite. Jacob was his mom's favorite. And because his mother loved him so much, one day she uh, devised a plan. And that plan was is that she had decided that she wanted her son to, well, get the double portion of those, of those blessings of her father. So one day, in fact, you have to know Esau, not only was a man's man, but he was a, he was a hairy man, a very hairy man, the Bible tells us. And so hairy that literally her mom, to trick her dad because her, uh, her husband was blind, couldn't see that what happened is, is literally took an animal's hair, wrapped it around Jacob's arm, put some scent of the outside of, of game on him, and went to his dad and said that he was Esau and deserved the first portion. He said, now, Dad, bless me. Speak your blessing over me so I can receive the double portion. And he did. Although his dad was a little skeptical, he did. And about that time, well, his other son Esau comes in and realizes he's been tricked. 
Jacob ends up leaving, knowing that his brother's so mad that he's going to kill him. If he can get his hands on him, he leaves and goes to Laban, his uncle, and goes there, ends up finding a wife. And God blesses him beyond measure. But God comes back to Jacob one day and says, you need to go back to your land. Where I sent you from, where you belong. And I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you more than you could ever imagine. I'm going to do things in your life you never could conceive. But you got to go back. And we find here in verse 32 that what happens is Esau, or I'm not Esau, but Jacob is on his way back to the land that he came from. All the trip, in fact, I can only imagine that the whole trip there, all he can think about is one thing. Esau. He knows God has promised blessings. He knows God has promised to do great things in his life. He knows God has promised to watch over him and protect him and keep his eye upon him. And he knows God, in fact, he's already blessed beyond measure. But all he can think about is the what if. What if Esau is waiting? What if Esau gets me. What if? So what happens is we find that as he gets closer to where his brother is, the Bible tells us that he literally divides his family, his servants, his livestock, everything he has, the Bible says he divides it. Just in case Esau attacks, at least one will survive. One part of the family will survive. Some of his wives will live. Some of them may not. But he divides his family. And he begins to set up this family in first, and it makes its way back. And what he does is he tells his servants in the front that, go see my brother, and, well, let him know I'm coming. Oh, by the way, give him 550 of my livestock. What do you think he's doing? He's trying to bribe his brother. He's trying to grease him up. He's trying to, you know, make him where he's not going to hurt him or kill him. And he's trying to set it up and just let my brother know I'm bringing 550 of my livestock and I'm going to give to him. And on his way there, finally one of the servants come back and say, well, we saw your brother. He's coming, but he's not alone. He's got 400 of his men with him. And that what if that was like this turns into that what if like it's this. Jacob now begins to freak out. He's, a, he's afraid and he's scared. And What am I going to do? The, the what is, what if I get up there and my brother attacks me? Remember, his brother was more of a manly man. His brother was more of a, of a fighter, more of a, of a warrior. Jacob's not. And so Jacob finally sends his family. The Bible says that, that he sends his family on the other side of the J book and he stays on the other side that night. And he begins to pray. Oh, if in our moments of need that we would learn the place we go is on our knees in prayer. That in those moments when we're struggling that we know that the one that we can go to is the one that can fix the problem. And that's what Jacob does. And, and the Bible says that that night what happens is, is that Jacob as he prays that he thinks it's an angel. It turns out to be God, but God appears to Jacob. He said, Jacob, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He says, your, no, your name will no longer be Jacob, but your name will be Israel. You see, what happens is that at that moment, Jacob is so afraid and scared of the what ifs that he knows that the only way that he can overcome it and get through it is to pray for God to take care of the what if. So that night, Jacob literally not only prays, but at, at first the Lord won't bless him. So he grabs a hold of the Lord and wrestles with God and says, I will not let go until you bless me. Oh, I wish y'all would do that. If I could ever get you to say, I'm going to get in a room. I'm going to get in the church. I'm going to get in the word. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to get my hands in the air. And I'm going to hold on to God until God gives me what I need and the blessings I need. And I won't let go. The Bible says that finally what happens 
As the God reaches down because Jacob won't let go, God reaches down, hits his hip, throws his hip out of joint, and finally Jacob lets go. And that's when he said, Jacob, because you have wrestled with the Lord and won, I say to you today, you will no longer be Jacob the trickster, but you should become Israel. That means prince of God, and out of you will come a mighty nation. Now, you see, I left out of that part a little part of the story. And that's the story between the meeting of Jacob and the meeting of Esau. Today I want to talk about that. There's some things I want you to write down as we talk about the what ifs. If anxiety is a result of fear, then the what ifs are the cause of fear. In other words, we become afraid. We become concerned. We become consumed about what could happen, may happen, but what may never happen. And it consumes our hearts and our minds and it begins to rob us. The first thing I want you to write this down today, say right here, preparing for a problem that could happen may prevent you from preparing for a promise that should happen. Every one of you sitting in this church today, God has a promise for your life, a purpose for your existence, a reason why you're here. And what happens many times is we become so consumed by the what ifs, the bad that could happen, that we don't see the promise because of the problems. Listen to what he says in verse 3. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau to the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed him, this is what you are to say to my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I might find favor in your eyes. I want to tell you something today. Fear will never give you favor. Fear will never give you favor. The only thing that will give you favor in God's eyes is faith. Believing the impossible. Saying that no matter what, God's in control. Trusting and believing that God can work all things out. We see here that what happens is this, in, in Genesis 32, we find that, in other words, he's about to send 400 men to, to Jacob's family. I get it, I've been probably afraid to. And I'm a scrapper. No, I'm a runner. I could have run faster than them. Uh, I was going on a missionary trip one time. I ended up not being able to go. But one of the pastors came to me and he said, John, how fast do you run? I said, man, I I don't know. I guess I'm pretty quick. I, I don't know. I said, why do you ask? And he said, well, we're going to Sudan, and I don't have to be the fastest. I just don't want to be the slowest because when they chase us, if you're the slowest, at least they'll catch you. Oh, wait a minute, the Lord's talking to me. Oh, I can't go to Sudan. I'm sorry. (laughs) See, in other words, what Jacob does, he puts his whole family, all his livestock, all his servants in front of him. Wimp. He's afraid. And he's scared. But see, the thing is, God's the one who sent him here. God's the one who planned this for his life. God's the one who set this in motion. But yet, instead of seeing the promise, all he can see is the problem. And he begins to prepare himself for what could be instead of what should be. If he had to focus on the should instead of the could, God could have and would have and should have done something amazing in his life. See, we have to come to the place that we don't live our life filled with the what ifs. See, he's about to give away all his possessions because of the fear of the what-if problem. See, that's what we do many times. We give away these things that God has planned for our life. We give away these possessions. We, We give away these promises. We give away these purposes in our life because we become so focused on what could happen, what may happen. We all do it. In fact, I would dare to say every one of you sitting in here, you at least have that that one what-if scenario that you're concerned about. What if I lose everything I've got? What if my spouse leaves me? 
What if I get that disease that I've been thinking about? What if, what if, what if? It begins to fill our minds and our hearts and it consumes us. You see, God never designed us. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, this is what God had said to Jacob. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go. Do you know that that was God preparing Jacob for Esau? He knew what Esau was afraid of. He knew what Esau was scared about. He said, we'll watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. In other words, what he was saying to Jacob at that moment was, Jacob, as you get close to the promise, what will happen is the devil and the enemy will scare you to think you're not going to get what I put in motion. But Jacob, I need you to understand, I'm making a promise to you that not only would I watch over you, but Jacob, I want you to understand that I will actually also take you to the land that I promise you. Then he says this, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Can, can I tell some of you today that maybe you're afraid of death. You're afraid to death of dying. But if God has made a promise in your life, God's not going to take you until he fulfills that promise in your life. There are some things that God just cannot do. Yes, you heard it here today at Compassion Church. Some of you didn't know that. There are some things God can't do. Did you know that? One of those is God cannot lie. In other words, if you met God today and he walked up and you said, God, how does my hair look? You had to say, mm, Jeremy, I've seen better, buddy. Love you, but it's a mess right now. If you walked up to God and said, God, how's my outfit looking? He'd go, well, it's okay. Because God cannot lie. That's the reason why I'll never ask God how I did when I preach, because he'd probably tell me the truth. Well, John, ooh. a while back I was preaching, and it was one of those big words. And I don't know what the word was, but afterwards my wife came to me in, in her loving, caring manner. And said to me, if you're going to say the word, say them right. <laughs> and I said, woman, the Bible says you're to submit to me. <laughs> and when I woke up, <laughs> when I came to, I, you know. See, many times what happens in our life is like Jacob. He got so consumed about the could be's that he forgot about the should be's. See, God has should be's for all of our lives. Purpose of plan. From the, from the biggest to the smallest, to the every days, to the long distance, to right now, to tomorrow. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. And we have to learn not to allow the what ifs to rob us. Number two, I want you to write this down. The what ifs are designed by the enemy to divide our focus. The what ifs are designed by the enemy to divide our focus. Let me read it again in Genesis chapter 32, verse 7. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided. See what happens? Fear and distress, the what ifs will always divide our attention. God didn't tell you to live your life worried about what could happen. God told you to put your faith in what is going to happen and trust him in that. He divided the people who were with him. Do you know that's what fear will do in your life? It will bring division of you and your family. Because see, what you're afraid of most likely your family isn't afraid of. But you're always so focused and worried about it, it consumes you and takes your time away from them. I wonder if Jacob, the closer he got, the more nervous he got. You ever seen someone that's nervous? Maybe he's sweating a little bit. You know, I miss that so bad. Pre-corona, I never used fingernail clippers. I always chip, chew my nails. Am I the only one who did that? I'm, there's one other person. Forget the rest of you. I don't care like y'all anyway. Don't you judge me. Just because I did my fingernails and my toenails doesn't mean a thing. 
Say don't think of no clippers, Jeremy. <laughs> but now because I don't like Corona, I'm scared of Corona, I won't do it anymore. And I've got girl fingernails, I really do. They grow by leaps and bounds. You girls would love my fingernails. I don't know why I went on that, that rabbit trail. <laughs> Divided the people who were with him into two groups. And the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. He thought if... Esau comes and attacks one group. The group that is left will escape. See, eventually the what if, they don't come without effects. You can't live your life afraid and fearful and think it's not going to affect your life. You can't live your life afraid of the what if. Listen, right now, think about it. There's a what if in your life you're always afraid of. What is it? What is it that consumes you? Drags you down, tries to, tries to take your life. See, fear and distress will then eventually cause you to do something out of fear that isn't in the best interest of your future. The what ifs will eventually get you to do something that is not in the best interest of your future. Jacob's what if scenario has now created a separation scenario. So one of the greatest tools of the enemy is to take your focus off of your promise and put it on your problem. See, that's why the Bible says that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of the air. Don't you ever let your life become focused on trying to get revenge, get back at somebody else, put someone else down, See, because the Bible wants us to understand that when we begin to focus on problems, the what ifs, what happens is it takes our fear, our faith, and turns it into fear. And what will eventually happen is it will separate us from the God scenario that he has for our life. Let me be honest with you. I've battled with fear most of my life. Whether it's hereditary, my father did, my brothers did. My sister did. We have struggled with, with the what ifs and the fears many times in our life. But you know what? I never let it get me down. I never let it take me away. I never let it become the, the forefront thought of my mind. I always say, Lord, I am telling you that the devil's trying hard today. He keeps putting the what ifs in my thoughts and in my mind. And if he's doing that, then God, this is what I know. If he's trying to scare me, then you must have something sacred for my future and every fear and thought that comes just means that I'm on the right track of doing God's will. Listen, if you're never struggling with fears or worries or anxieties, most likely because you ain't doing jack diddly squat. You don't scare the devil because you ain't doing nothing to scare the devil. How's the old adage go for every next level there's another Devil. You're going to fight something else. Every time God takes you to another level, listen, the devil's going to try to push you down, keep you down. But when he does, can I tell you, it is only a fake, fake battle. You've already won the war. You've already overcome. Number three, choose the right what ifs and let go of the wrong what ifs. Choose the right what ifs and let go of the wrong what ifs. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, it says this. That night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two family servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford. See, there was fords in the Bible. If you who are Ford fans, you got a Mustang, you're biblical. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I just, my attention just can't stay. The J. <laughs> After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Listen to this part right here. So Jacob was left alone. Can I tell you that's eventually what fears and what ifs would do in your life? They will put you in a ball, isolated. They will put you in a bottle, drinking. They will put you with a needle in your arm. 
See, eventually the, the what-ifs in your life will eventually bring you to a place of loneliness. Because no matter how many people tell you, you're worried about nothing, you're afraid of nothing. You, in essence, don't believe them. You isolate. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name, Jacob? It's funny, isn't it? What is your name, Jacob? He answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. See, there will come a moment, an aha moment, an enlightening moment, the light bulb comes on moment, where you have to make a decision in your life. Do I continue to let the what ifs dictate who I am and where I'm going? Do I continue in this life to struggle with fears and worries and anxiety? Or do I make a decision that in my life, I will turn my what ifs? Not what if I fail, but what if I succeed? Not what if I mess up, but what if I do it right? Not what if I'll lose it all, but what if, what if I'm blessed beyond measure? See, Jacob that night said, I'm going to change my what if. I'm not going to say, what if my brother gets me or what if my brother kills me? I'm going to wrestle with God and I'm going to say, God, I know, I know if you say it, if you speak it, if you proclaim blessings over my life, I know I'll never have to worry about another what if again. See, at times you choose the, the right what ifs. What if? See, no longer I turn the what ifs to the bad, but to the good. Not what I can lose, but what I can gain. Not what the problem will be, but what the promise is going to be. See, that night, Jacob fought with God. See, some of you need to have a wrestling match with God one night. I've done it. I love the movie you may have ever seen called The Apostle. It's not a Christian movie, but if you've ever seen it with uh, Robert Duvall, he plays one of those slick, big-time preachers. And he lost his way. He lost what was important about being a preacher. Yeah, he's on the run. He has to go to his mom's house. He's at his mom's house up day one day, and the neighbor calls and said, Would you please tell your son to shut up? He was upstairs having an argument with God. He was praying, and he was arguing, and he was fussing, and he was just letting God have it. See, some of you need to have an argument with God. Well, Pastor, that don't sound right. Can I tell you my God's big enough to handle your disagreements? And my God is big enough to handle your disappointments? And my God is big enough to handle your bad decisions? And my God is big enough to handle the destination that you've set yourself on that although may be wrong, He can help. See, in verse 27, God had made a promise to Jacob. And nothing had changed that promise. The only thing that had changed that promise was the fear of a what if. Let me say this to you. 
What if your what if comes true? It won't be the worst case scenario and it won't destroy you. Because can I tell you something today? That whatever you're in the middle of, if God is for you, who in this world could ever be against you? So worst case scenario, if it does happen, God is right there with you. We had a man years ago. He had cancer. And in my conversations with him, he would always talk about afraid the cancer would come back. I never forget one Wednesday night he showed up to the church and the nodules were actually coming out of his neck. He had already went and met with a the doctor. They'd sit for him to meet with an oncologist. And on that Wednesday night, right back there at the very back of that church, we met with him, me and one other person. And that night we prayed. And I said, I know you've lived in fear of this, but in the name of Jesus Christ, you're healed. He went to the oncologist that next day. The oncologist nurse was one of our church members. This is what she said when he walked in. She said, I don't know why you're here. You're healed. He went to see the doctor that day. The doctor says, I can't explain it. I don't know what to say. But whatever you had and whatever was there, it is gone. We can't find it. So we serve a miracle working God. A healing God. A gracious God. Let's turn our what ifs, not to bad, but to good. What if God blesses me? What if God gives me what I've been asking for? What if God heals my body? What if, what if God, I'm not afraid of the what ifs anymore because I know the what ifs are going to bless me and do great and mighty things in my life and everything, everything's going to be all right. I want you to stand with me. We want to thank you so much for joining us for our service today. We hope that you've enjoyed it. Before we let you go today, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. And over 2,000 years ago, God the Father gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to die upon a cross for you. That through His death, you would have eternal life. And through the shedding of His blood, you would have forgiveness of all your sins of past, present, and even future. So if you're watching right now, and you're right now living in a life of shame, sadness, and sin, I want to introduce you to my Savior. All you have to do today to be saved is first admit that you're a sinner in need of God's grace and wonderful love. Believe that He is the Son of the living God, died upon a cross for you, rose on the third day, and lives forevermore at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. And with your mouth, confess the Lord of your life, and you shall be saved. So if you're watching right now, and as I'm saying these words, it's touching something in your heart, and you say, today, I want to give my heart life to Christ, then I want you to say this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins and all of my ways. I ask you to come into my heart and into my life. I repent of my ways, and I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life forever and ever. Amen. If you just said that prayer with me, I want you to know that you are a child of God. Your sins have been washed away. You're a new creation, the Bible says, and eternity with Christ is your reward. Do us a favor. If you gave your heart life to Christ today, please let us know in the comments or reach out to the church, and we would like to tell you your next steps in following Christ Jesus. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you guys for joining us here at Compassion Church Online. If God has done anything amazing in your life, a story that you want to share, make sure that you comment below and let us know. We hope that you guys have a great week and we'll see you here next weekend.